good morning. I'd like, you, like to welcome you to service this morning. Um, first of all, just a reminder, uh, apart from me, but, uh, to wear your face masks, uh, cover your nose and your mouth even when you're singing. Uh, that'd be great to look after each other in that way and to, of course, sign in as we enter the church. Uh, as we get underway, here's a quote from Nicola McDermott, who's a high jump athlete competing in the Tokyo Olympic Games. Faith is confidence in things you haven't seen, right? Two metres. When I was eight years old, jumping 1.15 metres, you need a bit of faith to believe in that. I pursued sports so hard until I was 20 that I thought that was what would make me happy. Once I was an Olympian, once I reached something, then I'd be happy. I realised that no gold medal could bring lasting satisfaction to my heart. I discovered satisfaction was not found in a performance, but found in a person. Everything changed when I was introduced to Jesus. And that's who, uh, who we are on about here at Marichidor Presbyterian. Uh, welcome to church. And today, Shane will be preaching uh, about Jesus from Genesis 2. And I'm sure it'll be a gold medal sermon. Uh, glorifying Jesus, the King of all the nations around whom the whole almighty stadium will be packed with people from every people and nation to his everlasting honour and glory. Uh, let's stand and join together in singing, all creatures of our God and King.
There's a few announcements this morning. Uh, the first is, is if you are visiting here with us, you're very welcome, and it's great that you could come along. And there's a, a free book you can take from up the back. It's Essential Jesus. It's the Gospel of Luke and a description of the Gospel as well. And so feel free to take that. Another announcement is that last week the growth groups kicked off. And so if you're looking for a personal, uh, more intimate way of meeting with brothers and sisters, then you're most welcome to, uh, to contact Shane or Jens or myself and uh, sign up to a growth group. Uh, there's a number in a different locations that's convenient for you. And there's a booklet out the back uh, that you can take. And that's a study on Genesis that we're working through as in the sermons. A, a big key area of service that we can do uh, is doing the jobs that no one likes to do. And that's cleaning the church. Uh, so that happens every week. There's two people that come and do upstairs and there's two people that come and do downstairs. And so uh, it happens every week. Uh, we need about six volunteers. And if we have that many volunteers, then we can, it can be a monthly task on the roster. So you'd only have to do it once a month at a time that suits you as well. Uh, it's very convenient. <laughs> so it'd be great if we could have six volunteers uh, to see uh, Richard uh, would be great about volunteering to help with the cleaning. It's good exercise too. Uh, so that's the main announcements. The final one is that we don't take a collection here, as most people give electronically. Uh, but if you still give in notes or checks, uh, there's a Perspex box uh, out by the front door, uh, which you can contribute in for there too. Uh, now, let's, uh, Talia is going to come and pray, lead us in prayer. Being that we're looking at creation again today, which is awesome, um, I'm going to start out with Psalm 8 and then continue on in prayer. Let's pray. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Lord, we stand in awe as we consider the vastness and intricacies of your creation. As we learn more of your world, may we always be mindful of you as creator and give worship to you alone. Lord, forgive us for the times when we sinfully try to mould you in our image to justify our own ends. Thank you for your word. As we engage with it, we ask that you would continually reveal yourself and confront us with your infiniteness and our own fleeting dependence. Thank you that you are indeed mindful of us and that you graciously give us work to do in your world. Thank you that you continually sustain us and all of creation and that you are faithful so that we can face all circumstances with confidence in you. In contrast to your steadfastness, Lord, we live in uncertain times. Help us to live with the confidence of those whose lives are indeed hid with Christ and to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. In a world divided over issues of healthcare and identity and even the definition of our humanity and our dignity, may we always seek you first in worship, in our actions and as the source of our identity and value. Thank you for the gift of your people, the church. May we seek unity among the brothers and sisters, holding to the core truths of your creation, provision, salvation, and ultimate victory in Christ. Help us to be salt and light to those we meet daily. May we seek to be peacemakers in our communities, recognizing that the most important task is introducing others to you and the salvation that you offer through Christ. 
Lord, we do pray for the peace of our nation and of our world. Give our leaders wisdom in managing COVID. But beyond that, may they be passionate about justice, righteousness and human flourishing. Thank you that in all things you are sovereign and we can find our rest in you. Amen. Thank you, Talia. Uh, let's now stand together and join once again in singing. Uh, this is Amazing Grace and blessed be your name.
Thanks, Joel and Jody, for lead us, leading us in worship so well. Uh, now we're going to be watching the kids' video uh, from Mimi. So pay attention, kids, it's your special time. Hi, everyone. This term at Kids Spot, we're going to be following the Genesis series that the sermon is following. First of all, I want any kids who are at church to come to the front. We're going to be doing a few fun and games. Now, last week we learned that God created the world in just seven days. Well, technically, he made everything in six days. And the seventh day was a day of rest. Do you may remember what he made on the last day, the sixth day? Yes, animals and people. Can you imagine how the world was really quiet? Then all of a sudden, all sorts of animals started to appear and made a lot of noise. Now, I want to play a game. It's called Guess the Animal Noise. I'm going to make a noise of an animal and you are going to guess what it is and shout it out. Are you ready? Okay. Here's the first one. Can you guess what it is? I'll try again. It's a lion. All right, the next one. Shout out what you think it is. Yes, it's an elephant. Okay, next one. <laughs> Any guesses? That one was a pig. Okay, how about this one? <coughs> Any guesses? Try again. <coughs> that one was a monkey. And finally, what do you think this animal is? That one was a dog. Animals are awesome and God thought they were very good too, but he wanted to create something very special. He wanted to create something in his image. He wanted to create something with a soul, the ability to think, to love and to worship. A being that would be able to talk to God and have a relationship with him. God created Adam, the first human. Then God thought it won't be good for Adam to be alone, so he got one of Adam's ribs and made him a helper. He created Eve, and she became the first woman. Adam and Eve were very special to God because they were made in God's image. And you are all great, 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 great grandkids of Adam and Eve, which means you are also very special to God. You might not have a loud roar like a lion or a big trunk like an elephant, a funny nose like a pig or strong arms like a monkey or a waggly tail like a dog. But you were made in God's image and you are able to have a relationship with God. And that's what makes you special. You're welcome to go back to your seats and don't forget to take an activity sheet card from the foyer. See you next time. I'm always impressed by how skillful Mimi is. She can impersonate a dog impersonating a lion. <laughs> uh, Pauline is going to read to us now from Genesis 2, verses 4 to 25. The man and woman in the garden. These are the records of the heavens and earth concerning their creation. 
At the time the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field had grown on the land, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not made it rain on the land. And there was no man to work the ground. But mist would come up from the earth and water all the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. The Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden, as well as the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there it divided and became the source of four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, which flows through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Gold from that land is pure. Bedellium and Onox are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon, which flows through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which runs east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any of the trees in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat it, you will certainly die. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper corresponding to him. The Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. Then the Lord God made the rib. Then the Lord God took one of his ribs and closed the fresh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man, and the man said, This one, at last, is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. May the Lord give us understanding for his word. Well, good morning. It's good to be back. I've been on holidays for a couple of weeks and it's nice to be with you again. Uh, Let's pray as we come to God's word this morning, the second chapter of Genesis. Father God, would you help us this morning as we take a look at this zoomed in account of your creation narrative to see clearly the world that you created and the world that we will inherit one day as we think forward into the future of the new heavens and the new earth. And we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. I see trees of green. Red roses too, I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. So many of us know those wonderful lyrics from Louis Armstrong, don't we? From 1968. We even know it from Louis Armstrong of the RSPCA ad that used to play a number of years ago that used that same tune. And when we look around the world, there are some things about this world that are truly wonderful, but then 
we hear tragic stories of poverty and children who are starving and vandalism and uh, looting in places like South Africa. We see racial tensions. We see broken families, abuse, distrust of the authority and sometimes well-founded distrust and authority because there's corruption and the desire for power and control in the world. And we think to ourselves, maybe this place is not such a wonderful world after all. But it once was, and it will be again. And that's what we're going to see as we zoom into this account in Genesis 2 this morning. Well, last week we saw this cosmic view of who God was in all of his power, in creating things. He was doing a wonderful job in methodically and orderly putting things together in all the cosmos. And this week, we're going to zoom right in to part of that creative work. And we're going to see that God is not just the God of all creation, but he's a relational God who has a very specific purpose in what he's doing. Remember last week, Jens pointed out that the word God, Elohim, was used 36 times in that opening chapter. And and the name for God continues to be used in this chapter, but there's a shift that takes place. It goes from being straight God to Lord God. You may have heard that as the account was being read. And in your English Bibles, that word Lord will be in capital letters because that is the word Yahweh. It's Yahweh Elohim, which is the Lord God, the God who is both creative and powerful, but also the God who is relational. That name, Yahweh, is the name that God gives to Moses as his personal name for him and his people to call him. And so we shift from this cosmic view to this covenantal view of who God is. And it all starts there in verse 4 with essentially what is the first of 11 throughout Genesis kind of chapter headings. And they all begin with the same phrase, these are the generations of. So this is not just a second creation account. This is zooming into the creation account under this heading, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And if we zoom into this account, if, any, if ever the words of Louis Armstrong's song, Oh, What a Wonderful World, is true, it is here without a shadow of a doubt that they are. And, and the first thing we're going to see today as we walk our way through this chapter and see how wonderful our world is, is that God has made a wonderful world and he's prepared a wonderful place for us. Now, I've had four children, and a lot of people here have had children, but particularly when you have your very first child, there's a lot of effort that goes into preparing a place to bring your baby home to. The baby room has to be just right. We had these Noah Ark stickers on the wall for Michaela, and and we went down to the baby shop to buy all the things that we need. We thought we needed a cot and maybe a change table, but when you go into those baby shops, they give you this sheet with a checklist of things that you need if you're going to bring your baby home, and it's like two full A4 sheets of paper. You've got to tick off everything on there. You're thinking, what on earth is that? And if you go ahead and do it, you take it home, you'll soon realize you don't need half the stuff, but that's just what the the baby stores want you to believe. But, But as parents, you want to be a good parent and you want to prepare the perfect place to bring your child home to. And so you get all this effort to prepare the baby's room. And well, just like a good parent, we see God doing that here in this chapter of Genesis. See, last week the focus was on all of creation, but here we zoom in, it's about humanity's place in it. And God was setting up a room for us. It's interesting how it starts because the picture sort of feels as if creation's come to a standstill. All of a sudden, things have kind of come to a stagnant moment where where things have stopped. Let's pick it up again in verses 4 and 5. These are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation. At the time that the Lord God had made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field had yet grown on the land and no plant in the field had yet sprouted for the Lord God had not made it rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. So so in the midst of this creation narrative, things seem to slow down all of a sudden as we zoom in and we see that creation is waiting for something. It's anticipating something and we'll swing back to this shortly, but it's against this kind of stark background that we begin to see God who's preparing this place. It's God as a gardener preparing a garden in the middle of this creation, verse 8. 
And it's a, a garden that has every shrub, every bush, not only good things to look at, but things that are good for food, verse 9. And, and we see streams that are flowing through this garden, watering the ground as they go. Because God hadn't sent rain yet. We see that in verse 6 and verse 10. We see birds flying, we see fish swimming, we see animals roaming, verses 19 to 20. There's this wonderful world that God had made. There was pure cooperation between all things, no strife, no pain, no sickness, no toil. The ground is fertile, full of precious metals like gold and onyx. Enough moisture, but not too much. Things are growing and there's this relationship between Adam and the animals, which is a bit like a scene out of Dr. Doolittle, where the animals are coming peacefully to Adam to be named. No danger for Adam from the animals. No danger for the animals from Adam. We get this picture of God's natural world just as it was intended to be in all of its intricacies. And all of its wonder, and all of its splendor, it's absolutely breathtaking. Everything's in balance. I'm not sure you ever come across a guy named Hugh Ross and his anthropic principle. Uh, Hugh Ross is a scientist and the anthropic principle says that in order to support human life, everything in our universe and our galaxy has to be just as they are. He points out how our little planet hangs in the perfect right-sized galaxy, and that galaxy is in exactly the right location. He points out the Earth is on the right axes so that it can support life. And then there's the tidal forces of the ocean, the magnetic fields, the, the precise thickness of the Earth's crust. There's the oceans to continents ratio. There's the oxygen quality in the atmosphere. There's the vapor levels and the tectonic activity. And he says all these things are necessary in order to sustain life. Not just necessary, but in every little detail necessary to sustain life. And this is the picture we have in Genesis 2. God is setting that up. This very perfect place for humanity to dwell. It's mind-blowing. It's stunning. Because God is preparing a place for us. Everything is just right. And that leads to the next wonderful thing we see in this world. Not only is God preparing a place for us, but he also gives man this wonderful purpose. Because remember we noted that there, how creations come to this standstill. And the reason why there's no growth and there's nothing sprouting, well, we see it in verse 5. No shrub of the field had yet grown on the land. The plants in the field had not sprouted, for the Lord God had not made it rain, and there was no man to work the ground. So creation, it was waiting for this moment where God would create mankind. And it happens there in verse 7. And we're told that God creates Adam from the dust of the earth. I mean, think about that. From the dust of the earth. You, me, the dust of the earth. In fact, there's actually a word play going on here in the Hebrew. You see uh, the name Adam, which is the Hebrew word for man, and the word for ground is Adamah. And so it's a bit hard to get it in our English and how there's there's play on these two sounds of words. We could probably say something like, God formed the earthling from the earth to try and creak up that same kind of vibe, I guess. We are all earthlings, says uh, the alien. But the thing of how mundane this is, From the dust of the earth, God forms mankind. We are nothing more than dust, and yet we are also the crown of creation. We are the very reason why God created. He created a place for us, we're told. I reckon it's good for us to remember both the fact that we are the crown of creation, but also that we are the dust of the earth. The psalmist does. In Psalm 103, he says he remembers our frame. He knows We are dust. We should never get too full of ourselves. We've come from the ground. But then again, we're not just dust. We are the crown of creation. We're the climax of Genesis chapter 1. We are made in God's image, we're told. We've been brought to life through the breath of God himself, verse 7. See, we have this nobility like no other creature has. And on top of that, we're given this wonderful purpose, which we began to see hinted at in verse 5, didn't we? 
Why were things at a standstill? What were they waiting for? Well, actually, two things. God to send the rain, but man to tend to creation. For life to flourish in this garden, there was going to have to be this cooperation, this this joint operation between God and his creation, man. And the ideas continue to be kind of fleshed out in verse 15, because the Lord, he takes the man that he's formed from the dust of the earth and given life through his own breath, and he places him in the garden to do what? To work and watch over it. See, unlike the rest of creation, we see man uniquely given a task to partner with God in caring for and expanding his creation. A lot of people, when they pick up on this language, and then also the language of chapter 1, verse 28, about humanity having dominion over creation, they kind of drive application directly towards this idea of our paid professions and our work and our jobs and how important those things are. And look, that's a good discussion to have, but we've got to be really careful here not to deflect what's actually happening in these chapters towards some kind of like secondary application. Because what's clear here is that God has given man a wonderful purpose that corresponds with his. That's what we see clearly. Ultimately, what is that purpose? It's establishing and expanding the kingdom of God under Christ's rule. That is at the center of all of God's activity. This is the purpose that we see all the way throughout history. And this is what we see ultimately fulfilled in the end with the new heavens and the new earth. Here we see it in the form of God giving man this this kind of uh, partnership to expand God's creation through working and keeping it, multiplying it. It's a wonderful and glorious purpose, seeing God's kingdom grow under Christ's rule. And that's the same purpose that you and I have as Christians. But for you and I, it's not about expanding the, the borders of the garden, it's about expanding the borders of the church. It's about loving our neighbours, sharing our faith in Christ around the edges as our attitudes towards work, sure. Our attitudes towards the world that we live in and how we care for it and how we live in it, absolutely. But ultimately, it's about seeing people come under the lordship of Jesus as God's kingdom expands under the rule of Christ. So, so far, we've seen this wonderful place that God is preparing for us. We've seen this wonderful purpose that God has given us in partnering with Him in what He's doing. But we also see this wonderful prohibition, this one wonderful rule. Like I said earlier, my family and I have been on holidays for the past couple of weeks. And and last week, we spent a few days at uh, a place called Sandstone Point, just near Briarby Island. Uh, And we went there and and we had a wonderful time. But part of our plan was in the afternoon, we're going to wander down to the pool with with a couple of drinks and some cheese and crackers and let the kids have a swim and and play on the water park while Peter and I sat back and relaxed and watched. And, And that idea came quickly to a halt when we got to the gate of the uh, the pool area and it says no outside food or drinks allowed inside this area (sighs) i was disappointed and we're doing all the right things our drinks were in cans so there was no glass and we brought plastic plates so there's no something that's going to break we're trying to do all the right things and it wasn't as if we couldn't have food and drink in there because you could if you bought it from the bar and the cafe that's attached to the pool very clever right But this rule is annoying. But if you've ever been to these kinds of places, there's a bunch of rules like this. Heaps of them. No running. No going over 10 kilometers an hour. No music after 10 p.m. No pets allowed. No inverted maneuvers on the jumping pillow. Don't jump onto my Facebook page because there's a video of my son doing flips on the jumping pillow. Didn't see that sign, but that's one of the rules. Rules, rules, rules. And we might not like them, but often they're there for our own good so we can enjoy ourselves safely. And so you would expect that if if God has created this wonderful place for us, given us this wonderful purpose, that that he might have some rules for us. And and if we look here in the passage, he does, but it's only one. Uh, Verse 16 and 17. "And, And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any of the trees of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good or evil, For on that day that you eat of it, you will certainly die. 
Now, remembering back from verse 9, God places two unique trees in this garden, one being the tree of life and the other being the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life, it's there to express our dependency as human beings on God for life. He is the source of our existence. He's breathed life into us, but he's also the source of our ongoing life. It's our connection with him that gives us life, and it's our connection to this tree that God gives us in the garden. But then he's also given us this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, And this tree is good. We're told that in verse 9. All the plants of the garden are good. But this one we must not eat from. This one, God says, it's not for you. It's off limits. But why? And what's the big deal of knowing good and evil? It sounds like a good thing, right? Some moral discernment. That's, That's a good thing, isn't it? Well, you need to get this. You need to understand what's actually happening when God gives this, prohibita- this prohibition. This knowledge is not about simply the gaining of information. It's not about being able to look over there and based upon the information that I have in here to determine, okay, that must be evil and, and that must be good. It's not about information at all. It's actually about experience. It's about choosing what's good and what's evil. And that's why this tree was off limits. This tree was a test of obedience. God was saying, you must listen to me. You must trust me. I've provided this tree of life. You need to acknowledge that that your whole life, it depends on me. I'm your Lord, your creator, your sustainer, your lawgiver, your ruler. You must listen to me. I've given you all this authority in creation, and yet you need to remember that you still come under my authority. So eat freely of all the trees in the garden except for this one tree, because I'm the one who sets the standards. You don't get to decide what is good and evil. This is actually a really wonderful prohibition, a wonderful rule. Because us as humanity acknowledging that God is who he is, the one who has the rights to set up the standards. It's acknowledging that we belong to him. And if you know the story, and we're going to come back to this in more detail next week, this one rule gets rejected. You know, if we look around at our world today in the 21st century, it's obvious that this rule was rejected, right? Right? Because over and over again, we see our world trying to determine for themselves what is good and evil calling things that are evil good and things that are good evil because we've decided that we want to decide these things for ourselves. Marriage, gender, sexuality, morality, whatever you decide for yourself, that is good. The only thing that's evil in our world is to reject my right to decide for myself. Well, since we've mentioned this disoriented nature of marriage and gender and sexuality and morality in in the world that we live in today, it's probably no surprise that if we look at this account in Genesis 2, we actually see God's standards of these things and how wonderful his standards are in Genesis 2. Because you notice there's only one thing in all of his creation at this point that was not good. It's there in verse 18. It's one thing that has left undone would have mean things were not good. And that was that Adam was alone. And it wasn't because necessarily Adam was lonely, because he doesn't express any sense of loneliness. We don't know if he felt isolated, because man's not even mentioned. He doesn't complain to God about his situation. Rather, God himself declares it not good. So it's not Adam declaring it not good. It's God himself declaring that it's not good for Adam to be alone. And so there in this point of creation, there's Adam, but there's not yet woman. And God says, that's not good. And so he's going to remedy that situation. But that said, right up front, we need to just note this, because sometimes people can feel as if life is incomplete without marriage. And so so before we kind of deal with this, it's good to note that that's not necessarily the case. We, we see examples of Jesus and Paul who, who kind of have ministries without marriage. And, and it's good. Even though we know marriage is glorious and a creation ordinance, it's not necessarily the norm for everyone. Singleness is still a precious gift in the sight of God. But here in chapter 2, there's this clear focus on God's goodness in making humanity both male and female and how good that union actually 
is. So let's pick up this wonderful part of the story in verse 20. So the man gives names to the livestock and the birds of the sky and even the wild and every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding with him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man and he slept. And God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh in that place. And then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man sung. This one. At last, his bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both man and his wife were naked and yet felt no shame. What makes this world so wonderful? is that God had made this wonderful place for us, that he'd given us this clear and wonderful uh, purpose that coincides with his. He expressed his rule over us by giving us this one prohibition, but then also in this beautiful, complementary partnership between man and woman, distinct from one another and yet both created in the image uh, image of God, as we saw last week. Both having equal access to God. Both having equal worth and dignity before God. There's a distinct nature between man and woman, yet there is the sameness as well. Because you notice it's partly our difference that makes us in the image of God. We're told back in chapter 1 that in our image, God says, God created them So it's the maleness and femaleness of creation that actually reflects some of this image of who God actually is. So as we come to the end of this chapter, we see this beautiful complementary relationship and we're told in verse 25 that both man and his wife were naked and yet felt no shame. Life in the garden is good. A paradise. Things were as they were supposed to be. The land was good. Creation was good. Work was good. And most importantly, male and female marriage, it was good. Perfect innocence. They were naked and unashamed. They had nothing to hide. No shame. No embarrassment. Fully upright. Fully honorable. Perfect relationships between man and God God and man, male and female, female and male, perfect worship, perfect work, perfect obedience, perfect love. Oh, what a wonderful world. And this is the world that we long for. We see it here in Genesis 2 and we see promised for us in the new heavens and the new earth. This is a taste of what's to come for all those who cling to Christ See, there are a bunch of connections we could make from here all the way through to eternity. We can see the way in which God has prepared a place here, but he's also told that Jesus has gone before us to prepare a place for us in the new heavens and the new earth. We can see the purpose we've been given here and see that purpose driven towards eternity. We can see the trees of life sitting here in the garden. We see the tree of life in the new heavens and the new earth connected through the tree of life being Christ's cross. There's a bunch of these connections we can pull together, but but this is where I want to leave you this morning because this is where the text leaves us in this wonder of this beautiful world. See, this is going to set us up for the tension of what's to come. As we come to the end of chapter 2, we're meant to rest and marvel and wonder and celebrate the goodness of God in His perfect design for all things. We're meant to feel this, celebrate this, long for this. Because in the weeks to come, we see how all this is broken. But for now, bask in the goodness of God in all that he's created. Oh, what a wonderful world. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would help us this morning to truly bask in the beauty of your creation and your design 
for all things. The way in which you have beautifully prepared a place for us, not only here, but for eternity. The way in which you have given us a purpose that coincides with yours. The way in which you've given us this beautiful uh, prohibition that shows us that we come under your rule and authority. And this beautiful partnership that is uniquely in display between male and female, the wonderful union that relationship is and how that reflects the beauty of who you are. Lord, help us to truly bask in your goodness this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, just two last things. Uh, one is to remember to respect the 1.5 metre social distancing as you line up to volunteer to be a cleaner at church here, seeing Richard. <laughs> and secondly, I, I would be surprised if there's someone here you didn't uh, know, if you know what I mean. So try to find people that you haven't yet met before uh, after the service and encourage them. And uh, finally, there's morning tea after the service. Uh, there's not morning tea after the service. <laughs> So uh, things change rapidly in the, our nation and state. Uh, so yes, yeah, just as we meet in church and out on the lawns, uh, I encourage you to talk about the sermon, about the wonderful God who made the wonderful glory of this creation that we enjoy and praise him in. Uh, amen. Oh, no.